Please be aware, in this podcast series, we talk about all areas of safeguarding, which some people may find upsetting. So please make sure you're okay listening to today's topic. Be mindful of those around you, such as children, that you might not want to listen in. Hi, I'm SSS Safeguarding Director Sam Preston. And I'm former head teacher and content author Sarah Spinks. So today we're talking about safeguarding looked after children. So just to say that in, you know, before we get started in this webinar, conversationally, we're not going to verbally use the acronym LAC, uh, which we do use in, in practice um, uh, when we're writing things down. But conversationally, we're not going to use that um, to describe the group due to the perceived negative connotations. So um, we will be using the full term. So, right, to be clear, the term looked after children, um, it refers to those in the care of the state, such as foster care, um, residential care or adoption. We know statistically that looked after children and indeed those that were previously looked after, um, they're more vulnerable from a safeguarding point of view and from, you know, maximising the full potential, There's the, the barriers there. So, so why is that, Sarah? Why why are they more vulnerable? Well, many looked after children will previously have experienced violence, abuse or neglect. And these adverse childhood experiences can have a huge impact on their mental health, their well-being and makes them more vulnerable to perpetrators and abusive behaviours. Yeah. Now we've we've spoken before about adverse childhood experiences in our in our podcasts and um if listeners want to know more about that, tune into our webinar um, um, on um, adverse childhood experiences and trauma-informed practice. And we've also got um, training, our training course, so you can check that out as well. But briefly, Sarah, how does, you know, how do these adverse childhood experiences, how does that impact on, on, on the, the, you know, their lives? Well, such experiences can lead looked after and previously looked after children to display challenging behaviour and have problems forming secure relationships. Uh, Many find it hard to develop positive peer relationships. So it's important that those supporting these children understand their duty of care and that it's their responsibility to ensure their safety, well-being and positive development. So... That's going to involve a, 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 a comprehensive multi-agency approach, isn't it? Um, and everyone working in schools, academies, any educational setting, really, they're going to be ideally placed to support this vulnerable group, aren't they, due to well the frequency of contact compared to any other agency. So what are they, you know, maybe could you outline some of the key steps and maybe some of the practical considerations for safeguarding looked after children? Yeah, absolutely. You know, let's look at the the key provisions. So uh, firstly, there must be a comprehensive assessment in place. And this is a thorough assessment of each individual child's needs, risks and background history. And I'm presuming this assessment that should include input from social workers, caregivers, educators and health professionals. Yeah, it's crucial that this is a multi-agency assessment. So planning can fully meet, you know, all aspects of a child's needs and determine what support they need. We also need to ensure that caregivers, whether they're foster carers, residential care staff or adoptive parents are properly vetted, qualified and receive training in child safeguarding and child development. Yeah, I mean, that I know from my experience how important getting that placement right and that placement, you know, the stability of that placement, how, how important that is. We've really got to strive for that. I know frequent changes in living arrangements that can be so detrimental to a child's well-being. There's also though that continual need, you know, that that continual assessment, isn't it, of of the appropriateness of a placement. Yeah, definitely. And that leads us on to my next key area really, emotional support. You know, as we've already highlighted, many of these children have experienced trauma. So the provision of emotional and psychological support for looked after children is absolutely essential. 
So that's all part of trauma-informed practice, isn't it? Absolutely. And as you've said, you know, more details can be found in our training podcasts and articles on this. Okay. So let's look at the uh, let's look at education. So from uh, is it 2009? I think the governing bodies have all maintained schools. Uh, where they've been required under the Children and Young Persons Act to appoint a designated teacher to promote the educational achievement of looked after children and previously looked after children on the school role. Now, there's specific requirements for this role. Could you maybe give us an idea of what somebody undertaking this role, what, what their role is, what they have to do, Sarah? Yeah, so, you know, staff taking undertaking this role, you know, they're required to adhere to government statutory guidance to ensure that looked after children have access to quality education and that their educational needs are monitored and supported. And they liaise with the virtual school head. Who is the virtual school head? Who Who is who's that? Yeah, well, the virtual school head is in charge of promoting the educational achievement of all children looked after by the local authority they work for. And this includes admission to the most suitable school or other provision. They give advice and guidance to schools and they have the responsibility for managing pupil premium and pupil premium plus funding. You know, that's the additional funding which is used to maximise the best outcomes for targeted groups of pupils. And they work at that real strategic level. So the designated teacher, um, you know, on, actually, you know, on, on doing the groundwork, if you like. Mm-hmm. Uh, they liaise with and they've got the support of that virtual head then. So what other responsibilities do do they have? Well, that designated teacher has a key role. Uh, They have to make sure that each young person has a voice in the setting, their targets. Um, They need to be a source of advice and training for staff. And they need to ensure that they have that high expectations of looked after children and previously looked after children's learning. They help set targets to accelerate educational progress and ensure that they know their individual needs. Um, They also support and communicate with carers, including the local authority in their role as a parent, uh, promoting good homeschool links, which help ensure progress and encourage high aspirations, as well as leading on developing and implementing the PEPs or personal education plans for each child. So that's the plan drawn up to include all the information that everybody needs to help their conversations, planning, delivery of the strategies, so you know, that are required to ensure that child gets the support and provision needed to succeed. Absolutely. They also need to have, uh, they need to produce a report for governors at least once a year. That's important for that sort of accountability. Uh, They need to be the central point for initial contact within the school to help make sure that arrangements are joined up and to minimise any disruption to the child's learning. Um, They have to work really closely with the school's DSL or Designated Safeguarding Lead to ensure that any safeguarding concerns regarding looked after or previously looked after children are quickly and effectively responded to. And they also work closely with the school's Designated Mental Health Lead, the, the DMHL, which most schools are now receiving training on, to ensure that any mental health and wellbeing concerns regarding looked after and previously looked after children are sort of effectively responded to. Yeah, I'm really glad you've raised this because it's it's essential that the designated teacher for looked after children works with and is supported by both the designated teach, you know, um teacher, the, the DMHL and the safeguard and lead. It's got to be that collaborative approach within the school as well as within the community. Yeah, definitely. You know, they are a key part of the multi-agency structure, which should support the child, not just academically, but they've got to consider the health care needs of the child, including dental and mental health care. You know, the legal representation to advocate for their rights and interests. You know, they've got to regularly review of the child's care plan and progress, actively involve the child in those decisions about their care whenever possible. You know, their views and wishes should always be taken into account. Trauma-informed care practices that recognise a child's trauma history, you know, and provide a safe and supportive environment for healing. Developing those safety plans for situations where a child's behaviour or living circumstances pose a risk to themselves or others, and as well as ensuring that contact arrangements with birth families are appropriate. 
and safe and, you know, they're reviewed regularly. So I guess to summarise, this is a group within the school community who are known to be more susceptible and vulnerable and that they require that ongoing vigilance and that commitment to the best interest. Without a doubt, yeah, it's a shared responsibility by everybody in the school setting, but also amongst professionals, caregivers, you know, and the community to ensure that those children have the opportunity to grow and thrive, you know, in a safe and nurturing environment. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sam.